welcome to Franklin St. John United Methodist Church. You know, this is a place where everybody is somebody in Christian love. I want to invite you to come to this house of prayer. There's going to be preaching, praising, singing, shouting, and I believe healing is going to be in here. Amen. So I want you to come on here. Bring your family and friends. And know this much right here, that God loves you, and I want to tell you about a Savior who has nothing but the best for everybody. Come on to this house. God bless you. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this special hour of worship as we join together all across the nation, around greater New Jersey and around the world together in worship. My name is Pastor Land Wilson. I'm the director of worship for the United Methodists of Greater New Jersey. And I'm so grateful that you've joined us today. I believe that this is the day that the Lord has made and we ought to rejoice and be glad in it. God bless you. most gracious and heavenly father we give you thanks for another day god we give you thanks for another journey that you have brought us through now god we ask that you would take over this worship experience god we pray in the name of your son jesus that you would move on the hearts of each and every person that is gathered that is watching this service God, even in our respective places, we ask that you would turn them into places of sanctuaries, places of worship, oh God, so that you will be glorified and that you will be praised. God, even though the church is out of the building, God, right now we're asking, God, that you move by your might and move by your spirit because we believe that you are a miracle working God. And God, after all that we've seen you do in 2020, God, we're stepping into 2021 with anticipation, God, and expectation because you are still a miracle working God. 
And so right now in the name of Jesus, God, we ask that you do what you do. And that is have your way in this worship experience. God, we're asking that lives be transformed and that lives, hearts be given over to you. And so God, we're saying have your way in this moment, God. This is not just another encounter, God, that we showed up with. God, we showed up expecting you to do mighty works. God, we showed up expecting you to transform lives. God, we showed up expecting you to change hearts. And so God, right now, we just say have your way oh God right now we say do what you've always done and God that's because you are a God that never fails and so God we turn it over to you God we surrender our wills to you oh God we surrender everything that we possibly could that would distract us from giving you all the glory that you so richly deserve God have your way in this moment, God. Be with the preacher who will bring the word, oh God. Stir up the gift in her, oh God, so that she will uh, be used by you, God. Stir up the gift in her, oh God, so that, God, what flows from her lips, oh God, will be a manifestation of what's in your heart. And so right now, in the name of Jesus, God, we just say, have your way, God. Invade this virtual space like never before. God, we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome. So glad you're here today. In the United Methodist Church, we welcome all people. No matter where you come from, no matter what you're wrestling and struggling with, no matter the challenge before you or the great joys you have, you are welcome. And so thank you for coming today. I'm John Scholl, a bishop in the United Methodist Church serving Greater New Jersey. Greater New Jersey United Methodist Church is 520 congregations all across New Jersey, and we have about 30 church congregations, some in New York State and some in Pennsylvania. And together, we make up this body that seeks to follow Jesus and to be in the world to do the work of God. And so we're glad that you're here with us today. We look forward to worshiping with you and uh, just invite you to sit back, relax, join in, just open your hearts to God. First of all, I encourage you to give generously to your congregation. Your giving enables the church to move forward. And when you give through your congregation, you're making a difference locally, but also around the world. You see, a portion of your offering goes out around the world as well. One of the places it goes to is Tanzania. We here in GNJ have a partnership with Tanzania, and we're training pastors there um, in their ministry and in their leadership. The Tanzania church is a young church and uh, has over 100 congregations now, um, but many of the pastors have not been formally trained in theology and the Bible, and so our pastor's school is helping to do that. And a portion of your offering that you give today will help to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ in other places. Now, you can give generously to your congregation through your congregation's website, you can send your check uh, to, directly to your congregation. Some of our congregations have drop boxes. You can drop by and drop something off at the church. Or you...
Praise the Lord, everybody. I'm Pastor Leslie Houseworth Fields of the Mark Montclair, and I'm excited to worship with you today. I invite you to join me in reading Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. And I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. And it reads, From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water and the people complained against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for this opportunity we have to gather together in worship. Now, God, speak to us through your preaching moment. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and our redeemer. Amen. For the next few moments that are ours to share, I want to preach from the subject, Life After a Miracle. Life After a Miracle. A few years ago, Patty Moliterno, a wife and a mother of five children, received a phone call that her husband had died. Her husband had lost consciousness while playing softball with his church softball team. And for 12 minutes, he was unresponsive to CPR, where the brain begins to die after six minutes. However, paramedics were eventually able to revive Moliterno. And after arriving to the hospital, Mr. Moliterno sent his wife a text saying, hi, I'm still alive. Patty was overjoyed that her husband had survived this experience. His life was nothing short of a miracle. But Patty recalls that no one told her how to go on after such a traumatic and triumphant experience. In the weeks following Mr. Moliterno's near-death experience, he began to feel a growing sense of dissatisfaction with his life. Instead of constant feelings of elation and joy, he experienced a mix of emotions, including confusion, fear, and even guilt that he survived when others in his situation did not. Patty recalls learning that there was a high divorce rate among survivors of people who go through near-death experiences. There is a frustration with life that begins to set in and there are these unexplainable and unending unanswered questions about what's next. One particular study of people with near-death experiences found that there are some negative aspects to it. That some of those aspects include long-term depression, broken relationships, disrupted careers, feelings of alienation, and an inability to function in the world. Sometimes, the study said, friends expect superhuman patience and forgiveness from the person who survived the near-death experience. Sometimes people expect miraculous healing or prophetic powers and this pressure is too much for people to bear. Life is not always easy in the moments after surviving a miracle. And that is what the Israelites discover here in Exodus chapter 17. 
Here they are trying to adapt to life after a miracle. You see, just a few chapters prior to this, God had parted the Red Sea and allowed the Israelites to exit out of Egypt on dry land. Their immediate response was praise and rejoicing, but it didn't take long before the reality of this new life set in. They learned that life would not be picture perfect for them. And so while they were praising God and rejoicing at the beginning of chapter 15, by the end of chapter 15, the Bible says that they had gone three days without water. The people were thirsty and they started to complain, but God had not brought them that far to leave them. And so God instructed Moses to throw a piece of wood into the bitter waters at Marah and the waters were made clean and the people's thirst was filled. Things got better for a while. And the people continued on their journey. But in chapter 16, this time the people found themselves hungry. And so they started complaining again. Oh, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. At least there we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food that we wanted. You have brought us out into the wilderness to die. But once again, God demonstrated that God had not brought them that far to leave them. And so God rained down manna from heaven and God sent quail to them so that their bellies could be filled. And God promised them that if they would trust God and obey God's law and commandment, that God would continue to provide for them on the journey. You would think that after all they've gone through in the last few chapters, that by chapter 17, the Israelites would be getting better at trusting in God. After their deliverance through the Nile River, you'd think they'd know that God was a way maker. After purifying the waters at Mara, you'd think they know that God was a miracle worker. After receiving manna from heaven, you would think they would know that God is a promise keeper. After going before them as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire at night, they would know that God was a light in the darkness. But alas, the Bible says that they forgot all that God had done for them. By chapter 17, the people are setting up camp in Rephidim and there they find that there is no supply of water. And so because of their thirst, they become nostalgic about their time and their experience in Egypt. They start reminiscing about the good old days. You know, those days of forced labor under an inhumane regime. The days when they spent all day out in the scorching sun making bricks without straw. Those days when Pharaoh indiscriminately killed their sons. They became nostalgic and started looking at their past through rose-colored glasses. And family, that's why we've got to be mindful of our own thirst. As some young folks would say, the thirst is real. The desperation is real. And that desperation can make you nostalgic about something that God has already delivered you from. Th that thirst can make you nostalgic about that lover who didn't mean you no good. That thirst can make you nostalgic about the time where you had all of those fancy clothes, but you were living under crushing debt. That thirst can make you nostalgic about all the times you spent at the party and you can forget the way that that addiction almost tore apart you and your family. Don't let your thirst, don't let your desperation and nostalgia take you back to something that God has already delivered you from. I'm reminded of a story of Harriet Tubman and how she used to carry a shotgun with her on the Underground Railroad. And the story is told that the shotgun was there not just to protect the runaway slaves from slave catchers, but she carried the shotgun to encourage the escapees to continue on the journey to freedom. You see, often once they got out into those woods and they got cold and they got tired, some of the slaves would be tempted to return to the plantation. But if the slaves returned to the plantation, they wouldn't just be putting themselves at danger, but they would be putting other people on the Underground Railroad in danger. And so Harriet Tubman would provide a little motivation for the journey because she knew that the process of getting free, of navigating that wilderness was going to be difficult and it would be tempting for somebody to go back to their familiar bondage. 
And I know in the church, we like to say that God is not going to bring you to anything that God won't bring you through. But sometimes family getting through is the difficult part because when you find yourself in the wilderness after a miracle, that's when you've got to hold on to faith and you've got to hold on to God's promises and you've got to remember what God told you to do. If God told you to leave your job and start that business, it does not mean that things are always going to be easy. It does not mean that business is always going to be flowing to you easily. And you may be tempted to close down that business and go back to that job. But you've got to stand on God's promises and believe that God is going to make a way. See, oftentimes we find that the wilderness is difficult and when we get to the wilderness, we wonder if we're in the wrong place. But I remember that when Jesus was baptized, the Bible says that the spirit descended on him like a dove and a voice said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. But the spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. The wilderness does not mean that God has abandoned you. And if God tells you to go, then you've got to go. You've got to keep looking forward and not dwell on the past. The Israelites, they were nostalgic for their old lives. They fantasized about returning to Egypt because their brains were connected to their bellies. And as soon as their bellies got empty, their brains began to doubt God. Now, yes, there are some physiological effects of hunger and thirst, but how many of you know that God can work in your body in miraculous ways? What do I mean? Well, consider this. In chapter 15, the people had gone three days, we said, without water. Now, the human body can survive roughly 100 hours or four days without water. That's in moderate temperatures with little to no activity. In hot weather, performing strenuous activity, say like walking in the desert and transporting all of your belongings, chasing behind your livestock and carrying your small children, one's body would run out of water in about half of that time. I, I can't see your faces, but I know some of you are confused. Let me go through that again. The human body can survive roughly 100 hours or about four days without water. That's in moderate temperatures. But say you are in strenuous hot temperatures doing strenuous work, then that time is cut in half. So if you're hurting your livestock, carrying your belongings, carrying your children, the expected time for you to run out of water is one and a half to two days. But the Israelites are three days into their journey and they're complaining about being thirsty. And here it is, because some of you still don't get it. Let me break this thing down for you. The fact that they still have breath in their bodies and they still have the wherewithal to complain and they still have strength to even lift their voices means that they are a walking and talking miracle. They should have been dead and gone. They should have been shriveled up in that desert. They should not even have been in their right mind. They should have been delirious and yet they have the strength and the, and the wherewithal to know that they need water. And what I'm trying to say to some of you is that some of you have survived some things that should have killed you. You survived that cancer diagnosis that should have killed you. You survived that accident that should have killed you. You survived HIV AIDS which should have killed you. You survived the abuse that should have killed you. You survived COVID that should have killed you. You survived 2020 that should have killed you. And yes, it's been rough. And yes, You've had some struggles, but you can still testify that I'm still here. Is there anybody who can look back over your life and express some gratitude that you're still here? The fact that you can lift your voice and even find the strength to complain lets you know that you're still alive and that you still have a chance for things to turn around and get better. The Israelites... They were stuck in the past. They were looking back. And so they could not even see the miracle that was happening with them in the present. 
They were suffering from what one of my friends calls post-miracle stress disorder. They were trapped in those inaccurate memories of the past and blind to the provision God was making in the present. That's why we've got to be careful about our desperation and our thirst and our nostalgia because it casts an impossible standard for us that the present can never meet. Some of us are so desperate to get back into our sanctuaries and I know I'm ready to get back into the sanctuary too, but we've got to realize that the time before the pandemic was also a time of struggle. And perhaps this moment that we're in right now is an opportunity for us to hear from God in fresh and new ways so that we don't return to the habits that already were not working for us, but we can step into the new thing that God is doing in our midst. If the Israelites had been paying attention to the present, they would have seen the miracle was in the fact that they were still alive, that they still had breath in their bodies. But that was not the only thing that they would have seen. See, in verse 6, God tells Moses to go on ahead with the elders and he says, take your staff with you. This was the same staff that Moses found at the burning bush. This was the same staff that Moses threw down onto the ground and it turned into a snake. And when he picked it up, it turned back into a staff. This was the same staff that God used to bring thunder and hail over the fields of Egypt. Y'all not hearing me. This is the same staff that Moses used to part the Red Sea. All that time, Moses had the same materials with him that God had been using to perform miracles in the past. And some of you need to realize that yes, there are some things you lost and yes, there are some things you've been struggling with, but you still have with you the materials that you had that God used to bless you before. You still have your brain that is working. You still have ideas that are flowing. And if God could do it then, how many of you know that God can do it again. I'm reminded of a story that Whoopi Goldberg once shared in an interview. She said that when she first became famous, Elizabeth Taylor told her that every time she worked and had a successful project, she should get something for herself. And she should get something for herself because sometimes her career would be high, but there would be other times where her career would be down. And in those down times, she would need to look at those things that she'd gotten in the high times to be reminded of how good things had been and how good they could be again. And what I want to say to you right now is that some of you feel like you are in the down times. You feel like you are in the low moments and you're wondering if life could be good again. But what I encourage you to do is look back over your life and see some of the ways that God has provided for you before. Look back over your life and see some of the things that remind you of God's blessings in your past. Now, for some of you, it might be all of the Christmas gifts that you and your loved ones receive, but that ain't everybody's testimony. For some of us, it's just the fact that we have food on our table and it might have been a bologna sandwich or a hot dog with no bun, but the fact that we've got something to eat reminds us that God has made a way. For some of us, we're like the Israelites. All we have is the breath in our body that we use to complain, but the fact that we have breath in our lungs means that God God has enough to use to create something new. And so, yes, you might be down, but you've got to trust that God can do it again. If God healed you before, God can heal you again. If God delivered you before, God can deliver you again. If God provided for you before, God can provide for you again. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care how bad the situation is. How many of you know that there is nothing that's impossible for our God? So I'm reminded of the hymn we sing in church. I, I want you to take these words with you wherever you go. No matter what you're going through, be not dismayed. Whatever be tied, God will take care of you beneath God's wings of love abide. God will. I said God will 
Yes, God will take care of you. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you. We thank you that you've allowed us to see life after a miracle. That right now, God, right now we have made it through uh, some difficult days. God, there were times we thought we weren't going to make it. There were times that we thought we were at the end of our rope. And yet, God, you carried us through. And so help us to trust you now, Lord. Help us to trust that you're still making ways out of no way. Help us to trust that you're still opening doors that no person can shut. Help us to trust that even on the darkest nights, the sun will shine again. Bless us, Lord. Keep us. Carry us. And help us to trust in you. And God will be mindful to give you all the praise, to give you all the honor, and to give you all the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and thank God. Amen. Did not our hearts burn as the word of the Lord came to us today through Pastor Houseworth Fields? I'm taking this moment now to invite you to a relationship with Christ Jesus. If you don't yet know the Lord personally, it is not too late. And let me tell you, it's the best thing, the best thing that's ever happened to me. And so if you want to know Christ for yourself, would you just type that in the comments today? I want to know Jesus. And we have folks that will be reaching out to you and praying for you. I'm going to pray in just a minute. If you're looking to renew your faith in Christ today, to renew your relationship with Christ, you've strayed, you haven't been talking to the Lord as you should. You haven't been giving as you should. You haven't been trusting in God as you should. I'm going to pray today that God would renew you. Would you just type that in the chat? Renew me, oh God. Would you just say that out loud wherever you are? Renew me. And we're going to ask that God would restore and renew you and renew that relationship with God. And lastly, whatever it is that you need in prayer today, would you just type that in the comments, if you will? Those of you that are watching live, those of you that are on Zoom. If you'll just type that in the comments. And we have folks that are going to be interceding and praying for you, pastors from all across greater New Jersey, as well as our intercessors in the local church that are going to be lifting up and praying for you. So would you just type that? And I believe God can and will answer prayer. Amen. God, we thank you so much for the word today, for how you've spoken to our hearts, for how you've lifted our heavy heads. And now, God, you've encouraged us and given us strength to run on to see what the end's going to be. God, we've got strength to make it through this week because of you. We've got joy to get through the coming days because of you. We've got peace because we know you. And so I pray for my brother and sister that's hearing my voice right now, God, that needs a relationship with you, God. God, that they would seek you while you may be found, God, that they would welcome you into your heart, that they would even pray right now, God, I accept you into my heart. And I pray for my brother, my sister, my sibling in the Lord that needs to renew their relationship with you today, oh God, that they would just ask you to restore them, that they would ask you to renew their faith, oh God, and that they would seek to have a deeper and closer renewed relationship with you. And now, oh God, for every need that's spoken and unspoken today, God, for every family, every home, God, for every person that's under the sound of my voice, God, you know us, you've made us, God, and you understand even our moans and groans. You understand even the things that keep us awake at night. So I pray, oh God, that you would hear our prayer. Thank you, Lord, that you hear prayer. Thank you that you answer prayer. Thank you that there's nothing too hard for you. Thank you that you can and will work miracles. And so, God, for those of us us that are waiting on the miracle, I pray for a spirit of expectancy. For those that oh, those of us that are in the process of the miracle, God, sometimes it gets hot and uncomfortable, but it's because you're trying us in the fire and you're purifying us just as gold. And so we pray, oh God, for the life after the miracle, God, that as we walk after the miracle, God, that we would walk in the newness of Christ, that we would walk in the hope of the Holy Ghost, that we would walk in the joy that only you can place within us, oh God. And I pray that we will move forward and, and press forward, understanding that there's still more worth fighting for, that we've still got work to do, that we've still got a journey to complete. There's still souls to save and we still have a charge to keep. So this is our prayer, asking that you'll strengthen us for the journey in Jesus name. Forgive us, oh God. In Jesus name we pray. 
Amen.
receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace today and always. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you for joining us in the Cyber Sanctuary. We truly pray that you have been blessed. Here are our additional announcements for the week. We extend sympathy, love, and prayers to Mrs. Esther Tyndall, Mr. Kingsley Tyndall Jr., and Ms. Esther Tyndall on the death of her husband and their father, Mr. Kingsley Tyndall Sr. Please continue to connect with the church by participating in the following activities. The prayer experiences that you can participate in are Morning Glory Prayer, which is held every Sunday at 9.45 a.m., and the Pastor's Prayer Conference Call, which is held every Wednesday morning at 6.30 a.m. The call-in number is 1-712-770-5005. The PIN code is 790-771-POUND. The Agape Food Ministry is open to the community on Wednesdays from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Please come to the food pantry. It is open to all members. No questions asked, no forms, no papers to fill out. Please come and be blessed. The Sunday School continues to meet in the cyber format. The Sunday School is now meeting every Sunday from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. The call-in number is 978 990 5000. The access code is 249680, pound or hashtag. Superintendents are Brother Edward and Sister Joanne Metal. Please join the Sunday School as it is dynamic. And lastly, the Music Ministry's Zoom hookup continues to meet. They meet now on Tuesdays. If you would like to join them, please contact Sister Cookie Green for the call in number and the access code. This Zoom hookup is open to all members of the church. Christian friends, these are our additional announcements for the week. You may give your tithes, offerings, and gifts by doing one of the following. Use the mobile app Givelify. You can download the mobile app in the Google Play Store or the App Store on iPhones. Look for Franklin St. John's. Click on it and you can give your tithe in three taps. You may also place your tithe in the tithe box, or you may mail your tithe to the church, or you may give directly through our website. The link is listed underneath the description of today's service on our YouTube channel. Christian friends, the building is closed, but the church is open. May God bless you from the north, south, east, and west until we meet again. Know that a miracle is coming your way. Thank you.